good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is Rob Barnett, and I'd like to welcome you to today's BI Energy Exchange, where we talk about our research and the latest developments in energy markets. Uh, today on the call, we've got a uh, special guest, Mike McGlone, uh, just sitting uh, opposite of me here in Miami today. And uh, we've also got uh, Patricio Alvarez joining from dark and cold London. So uh, if if uh, any of you uh, were able to join us yesterday in Miami for our live event, I want to thank you for attending. And I think that's probably a good place to start here today. So we have myself, Mike McGlone, Fernando Valley, who's a regular on here. We also had our app spec, Paul Reagan and Jason Miner, who's the head of our uh, agriculture product and business. So, Mike, we had a lot of interesting viewpoints, and normally I feel like you're the outlier where you'll come on and <laughs> talk about and how you see the world, and many people will disagree with you. But I think yesterday you were kind of aligned with almost uh, everyone else that had, that had a view on the market. So anyway, share a little bit of your view from yesterday's discussion and, and, and use the time to talk a little bit about kind of how, how you see oil and gas going over the next six to 12 months. Well, I, I appreciate having me involved, Rob. It was a very good event. It was really good to get insight from people and commodities in Miami. And I just, it harkens back for me, a uh, former advice from a, former manager of mine when I was a trader says, Mike, you say it better than you do it. I'm typically way too early, which is bad for a trader. So it doesn't matter when you're a trader. If you're early, you're wrong, you're wrong, you stopped out. And what uh, my sense is happening now is the world's starting to come around to what I pointed out was going to happen in 2022 is this high price cure is going to be resolved by low price cure. So I have to point out right now on the screen, the price on U.S., the number one benchmark for heat, electricity, and fertilizer in the country in the U.S., for natural gas, I'm looking at the screen right now. The tick right now is 164. That was the when it futures first started trading. The first day it settled on April 3rd, 1990. It's actually the year I got married. Um, that was the first closing price. So I, I earned the nickname as McGloom, and I, I own that. And I only mean that from a commodity standpoint, any commodity producer, and most notably trader, gets it. That the worst, it, this, this, macroeconomic factor of the high price cure with rapidly advancing technology and elasticity of supply and demand is only increasing and that combination of the biggest pump and liquidity effort ever and Russia's invasion of Ukraine was one of the biggest we will look back as one of the biggest catalysts and tests ever and it's completely passing things I've read in the domino effect that was Russell Brazil and the price of tomorrow by Jeff Booth. I can mention another half dozen books about how technology is happening so fast. It's really bad for tan the prices of tangible assets, i.e. commodities, and very good for prices of intangible assets, like the stuff you focus on more equities um, and things like cryptos and Bitcoin and stuff. So the key thing I want to focus on, focus on and at least let's focus on, I have to go to natural gas because it's historic. Um, and but the good news is we're now at the point where we're probably tilting towards the low price cure. We are below the cost of production. It's around two bucks in this country, and that's somewhat, somewhat dicey if you look at break-even prices from BTU analytics, stuff we have in the terminal. Um, and the thing is, we can't stay up very long because we saw what happens. We have the spikes, but we can stay low for longer. And the key thing I want to point out is what our colleague uh, Jason Meyer brought out is you look at the correlation with Brent or WTI. I just like to look at the WTI versus crude oil spread. Right now, it's about 40, 48. That's in futures. The high, all-time high was 53 in 2012, and that's right before crude oil dropped about 30%. And what it, and so I show to me a substantial premium in crude oil compared to natural gas, compared to corn, less so in copper, but most notably industrial metals. And it's the outlier for me in all commodities. And yes, I've been early, and yes, I've been wrong, but I still think I'm putting fill or kill on it this year. I think crude oil goes to $40 a bill, WTI. Um, and part of the prerequisite for that is, the U.S. stock market, for that not to happen, the U.S. stock market has to keep going up. And it's despite it going up, crude oil is kind of hovering here. But right now, this level here, about 80, is significant. It was kind of the low from 2011 and 12 when we had this last big 
divergence in crude oil versus WTI. And there's also the high right before, around the high, it was bumping up against, against there before we got to the, you know, Russians invasion and stuff like that. So I look at it as um, we're near the upper end of the range around 80. I think it's going to drop till 40. Obviously, I have a view, and that's one thing about having views. You can definitely lose your hair with things like this. Um, I don't see what stops it. And then I look over in the macro. I'll, I'll go shorter on this. I tip on, tilt it over to the macro, and that is that um, – China's clearly in decline. Now, when I started putting that with, with editors two years ago, they said, Mike, what do you mean in decline? Well, we all see what's happening now. Um, and the significance of the unlimited friendship and the macro, I think people are starting to see that what happened with this largest demand pull source for um, commodities on the planet has sided with the bad guys, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. And there is no upside right now. I think I, it's very much what I've read about in the book um, Atlas Shrugged about, um, by Ayn Rand, what we saw in Japan. I worked for Japanese firms in the 90s, what we saw happen with Soviet Union. China's doing that, so all commodities are going that way. But So that's the macro. U.S. stock market, if it tilts lower, all commodities will have a problem this year, um, particularly crude oil and copper. And the way I'll end it with is um, I don't see – what it's going to take, you know, we can't measure on, on geopolitical events, and maybe Patricio can help with that. But right now, there's such a premium in crude, and it's the stuff that you cover, Robin, and you do, Patricio, with this rapidly advancing technology and what's happening with um, uh, electrification, decarbonization. And the one thing I did enjoy, I'll end with this, is when we were having our, our conversations last, last yes, sir, Fernando, we love the banter, and he's not into new energy, renewables and all that. I am. I'm from a farm. You, saw, you know, a lot of the corn we planted um, was going for uh, ethanol. So I, I brought my electric bike into the uh, presentation as, as a prop, and I ha figured I got to because I had it there, and I'm like, that's where the world's going. Just look at all these people in India riding around in, in you know, two-cycle motorcycles. In New York, they've all shifted to these less electric bicycles. bicycles. They're cheaper. They're more efficient. Yeah, there's negativities, but it's just where everything's going. So um, I look at it as crude oil's in a clear – and commodities in a clear bear market, and it's, I think they're all going to follow the example of natural gas. Back to you. Okay, thank you for that, Mike. Very interesting. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, – Stay tuned with uh, these virtual events because we always mention upcoming in-person uh, events where you know we're going to be speaking. And so this isn't just a virtual community. There, there's a real-world community as well. So, Patricio, I want to come over to you. I think one of your uh, top ideas to watch for the year is I think you've got a pretty similar um, case for the outlook for gas and power prices in Europe. So why don't you set that up and contrast it uh, with, with how Mike is seeing uh, things unfold here in the States? Sure. So, um, yeah, I agree. Mike was, Mike was perhaps early. Uh, he's been calling for this since last year, I think. Um, I don't think our, our view was very much uh, different from that, but we, uh, we, we didn't see these aggressive pullbacks um, last year as we did this year, and, and that pertains mainly to demand. Uh, so, so demand for, for European gas uh, fell by high single digits in 2023, um, and so did power demand. Uh, power demand fell less than, than that. Uh, power demand fell around 3%. Um, so with, with that in mind, with that outlook for um, looking forward, the economic outlook in Europe does not look um, great. The, the consensus for GDP growth here is just around uh, 1%, uh, which is just short of, of being almost in, in a virtual stagnation. So uh, we don't see a lot of upside for, for demand in, in 2024, um, other than perhaps some normalization uh, from, from the weather. So we had a very mild um overlaps in winter for 2023 that were very mild in terms of temperature so uh we we may see an increase year over year um on on weather relating uh related consumption um but the big uh, i think the big offset it, it it pertains to what mike was alluding to as well is that um renewable capacity is going to expand uh once again and, and more so than it did in 2023 so there's going to be more renewables in 2024 meaning that the pool on coal and gas for for power generation is um is it's going to come down even further um and if, if you put on top of that that the industrial complex here in um in europe um, it still faces a pretty bleak outlook um not only because um gas prices even though they they're 
they're, they're very much cheaper than they were two years ago. They're still relatively elevated for, for industry to, to pick up um, production. And also um, th there's an over-reliance on, on, on Chinese um, exports here in, in, in Europe. And, um, and there's also an expected slowdown in China in terms of, um, of trade. So um, th there isn't many reasons uh, for us to think that, um, that European gas prices could um, trade up from where they are at the moment. Our call is for prices to be around 25 to 35 euros per megawatt um, hour, which, which translates to roughly $7.7 per MBTU, which is you know, six times, five to six times um, what, what the price is in the US. Um, so that, that shows you why industry will have a tough time trying to, um, to recover this year here in Europe. Um, and well, at the moment, uh, European gas is trading at about 25 and, and we think it will stay range bound and perhaps uh, drop during the summer uh, a bit below that, but average out at around 25 throughout the year. Um, and since gas still uh, sets the marginal price for wholesale power prices, that means that wholesale power prices will also um, will come down quite significantly versus last year and perhaps below below consensus. So we think power prices may be between um, will be closer or below 70 euros per megawatt. They're, they're currently at, at around 60. Um, and that what, what that means uh, for, for our sector, for, for the utility sector is uh, there, there's two effects really. Uh, in the short term, uh, it means that energy supply costs uh, will come down for utilities and they will continue to benefit from higher um, hedging secured during the energy crisis. Uh, but on the flip side, it will um, deter from their future earnings uh, profile because they will not be able to hedge um, the, their future sales at, at elevated power prices. Um, and at some point that, that will sort of come to bite the, the earnings scope for, for utilities, especially because we've seen a slowdown in, um, in the electrification trends, mainly because of, um, of this setback in, in, in demand, which we think it's, a, it's sort of a near-term setback rather than, um, than an underlying change in, uh, in where demand is going for power. Very interesting, Patricio. Uh, I think it ties in very well with a piece that's on the wire this morning from our colleagues over at Bloomberg News uh, that uh, the title of that uh, uh, piece is Shell Lowers LNG Growth View as Demand Set the Peak in the 2040s. Uh, I think the the article notes that uh, you know LNG specifically uh, could grow uh, pretty substantially through 2040, but that gas demand in some regions, uh, including Europe, uh, likely has already peaked, at least in their view, which sounds similar to to how you're thinking about it, uh, Mike. I want to come back to you and just get your reaction, given how look cheap uh, in relative terms Henry Hub is at the moment. Uh, do you think that that is going to provide you know, more incentive, more LNG in the future? Does it, is, is there a demand response to this very cost-effective gas resource that America has been producing and bringing to the market? Uh, there should be. I mean, this is where we are now. We're in the low price curve stage where we should just demand should ramp up and supply is what's the hurry. I mean, there's you're, you're not going to be doing what you can to bring on more supply. Um, obviously, there's a little more of a tail there. But um, that to me is the problem now. It's, it's actually finally a good thing. This is a reason now you're supposed to start getting bullish prices. Um, but it might take a while versus when they spike like they did last time. This is just a typical reciprocal reaction. Um, the difference is I really appreciate, and some I was taking notes, some of what Patricio was saying is it's the macro that to me is more. Now, LNG is more micro, and there's, you know, we've heard about a recent Biden administration pushing back on some um, LNG um, uh, regulations, but there's so many in the pipeline already. And what do we export up to not even 20% in this country yet? And we have this massive excess supply and prices ever got up. The whole state of New York could open up, but it didn't happen. But it's the macro I think is more significant there. And that is what you're seeing is very stagnant and very recessionary growth in Germany, but very stagnant growth in Europe. But what takes us out of that? Um, maybe a little demand pull from the US, but 
typically it takes a long and variable lag to easing. And not any major central, ba central bank in Europe has started easing yet. So the cycle is just horrible for where we are. It's just the wrong end. So uh, the way I see it is at least natural gas, the highest volatile U.S. natural gas, the highest volatile um, commodity, and oftentimes a leading indicator, at least has reached that low level now. It's in the shutdown supply and increased demand mode. How that happens, where that goes, it takes take a while, but it's the macro that, that I'm really concerned about is in Europe. You mentioned the recession. I, I, well, the, you know, stagnant growth. In, in Germany, is clearly recession. And um, what's been the major export or import client is China. And what's happening there? I mean, China looks at Europe as it was the number one export target and US was number one or two. And it's GMTFO now from all these, both these, these continents um, get me the heck out of China. So I don't see what's going to come from. And I'm just worried about this major recession that never happened in the U.S. is just about going to happen. Because look at the cycle is, um, you look at the inverter curve, you look at leading indicators, they still point very bad. And there's one key thing that's holding everything up. And I think that's the U.S. stock market. So um, as far as Henry Hub, now it's at levels like, yeah, you have to be looking to be a responsive buyer. You expect that. Um, it's just a question when it happens and how it happens. And one thing I really like to point out is um, let's tilt over to the most elastic sector, um, the grains. Um, and you can't say grains anymore without energy. And I did like pointing out in this presentation yesterday how some people push back in the fact that one third of U.S. corn crop is used for transportation. Well, before the Model T Ford, the vast majority of U.S. farmland was used for transportation to feed horses. We're just going back to a more a higher, um, a, a, a more advanced level of doing that. But if here, here's the, the macro that's happening. There's just a massive oversupply and excess supply right now in inventories of corn in this country. Farmers are 30% above their normal, and they're just waiting for levels to sell. That's indicative of all commodities. I think that's just the outlier. And you look at copper. Copper is a little less like that, but it's down 4% in the year. It had a little blip because of Canada, and now it's tickling down again. Why? You have to look over at China. The outlier is crude oil. So I'm worried that crude oil just catches up. We we you know we do this normal every time it bids on Friday and goes back down on Monday. At some point, that flips over and realize that. These high prices are just accelerating the trends, and I don't see, um, and I'm oh, really hopefully don't have a geopolitical event, because I remember, I think it was September uh, 2019, remember when the Saudis um, infrastructure was attacked by, uh, I think it was the Houthis, it gave us a big pump, and that turned out to be the dump. So that's what typically happens. I think traders are waiting for that. So what's happening, I'll also point out, is you have to look at managed money net positions. This is one thing I really like to point out is I'm more of a top-down guy and the fundamental bottom-up hasn't been working and one thing from a top-down standpoint you have to look at managed money net positions like hedge funds they are record near record short the grains almost ex extreme as during the major you know when Trump was having the trade war with China in 2019 and I look at this okay well they should be but now they're all going to get stopped at some point and the, the more rational people will sell um, but those shorts, I think, are going to tilt over to where it's really, if you look at a broad base and you're a commodity trader, where's the, the VIG, where's the potential downside in the bear market? It's crude. Crude's the outlier, the main outlier, the major commodity that has the downside. And everybody knows it's just going to be a flip of the switch. Maybe we get a pop first for people to sell, but I'm just looking for that flip. And here's what I'll end with. Some people in our in our conversation will remember a economist named John Lishio. He used to write the current yield for Barron's and he owned his old, old, old report, Lishio report. He died a few years ago, but he used to call commodity traders dope sniffing dogs. And that's what I remember well coming from the trading pits. They're just looking for the opportunity. There's no short opportunity in natural gas anymore. There's very little short opportunity in the grains. Copper is going down. The short opportunity, if you're looking for a potential VIG, is in crude oil. And if you're looking to buy it, good luck. The fundamentals are negative. M Mike, I want to bring up another commodity uh, that we don't talk about as often here on this call, but I think it's hyper relevant given the group here today. So European carbon allowances have uh, really taken it uh, on the nose over the last 12 months. Uh, we're currently at about 56 euros a ton. Uh, this is down 40%. Uh, if you look at our commodity primer, one of the things that we note and, and have pointed out fairly recently ahead of the pullback is that emissions in the power sector, in particular in Europe, uh, declined uh, quite a bit last year, about 13% uh, 
is the sort of range that uh, some folks are talking about. And so I think that very much ties into the own gas and pow power markets, Patricio. So, you know, is that decline that we saw in European emissions, is it structural? Is there a bounce back? And uh, I know you and I both kind of at least look at the uh, European carbon a little bit. What, what do you make of the, um, the decline uh, that we've seen in prices there? Yeah, I think that that is responsive of um, of the demand dynamics and also how the the, the power stack in, in Europe has evolved uh, over the past few few months, or maybe six to twelve months. Um, so the main difference um, when we from, if we take twenty twenty two as the as the baseline. Uh, when the energy crisis started and Russia curtailed um, gas supplies significantly. Um, the continent at the same time experienced uh, outages in nuclear power. There was droughts impacting um, hydro reservoir levels. Um, so that meant that, uh, that Europe had to buy that very expensive gas and very expensive coal and pay those very expensive carbon costs in 2022. Um, so now uh, we, what we've been seeing is sort of a, re a complete reversal of that, mainly driven by higher hydro levels, higher nuclear output, sort of is a reversal of the perfect storm now where demand is, um, is anemic, uh, demand is very low. And we also have a very well supplied power stack from base load sources so hydro and nuclear. Um, and we've seen, seen, we've been seeing sort of the same dynamic with gas fired power. Um, gas is cheap enough that is cheaper to burn than coal, considering baking into the cost of carbon. So that explains why carbon prices are, are cratering. Uh, but moving forward, uh, we, we don't think that this is a structural trend. Um, overall, the, the bank of emissions will get smaller um, and hopefully we'll see an economic recovery as well, perhaps beyond 2024. So demand for, for energy should once again at, uh, at least stabilize. Um, and since the bank of, um, of emissions will get smaller over time, that, that should support the economics of, of carbon prices over the long run, because that, that's the main sort of um, the main regulatory tool that, that the EU has uh, to phase out coal. You know, one of the uh, things I'll point out here, we've got a, a question in the chat. And by the way, if you're listening, feel free to pop a question in. We'll, tr we'll try to get to it. And if we don't, we'll follow up afterwards. But the question is, how does the sell-off in natural gas forward curve impact renewables uh, that price uh, marginal megawatt against natural gas? And you know, I'll just weigh in quickly on that, but I, I want to get your views as well. You know, the, the, the one thing that I think we're observing in both wind and solar is just a really phenomenal uh, demand growth trajectory. If you look at solar installations globally, uh, they increased about 70% last year, over 400 gigawatts of capacity uh, got it installed. And a big portion of that actually is being driven by China. So Mike, if, you're, if your thesis on China is right, uh, maybe we'll see a potential uh, slowdown in the pace of wind and solar. Uh, wind is also heavily geared uh, towards uh, China. The interesting thing about that, though, is that uh, there does tend to be a bit of regional segmentation in terms of kind of who participates in the various markets. So the Chinese wind market is dominated by Goldwind and other uh, China equipment suppliers, Vestas, Nordex, Siemens. Uh, they're at very prominent in Europe and generally the West, uh, also with GE. Uh, in the in the mix as well. So uh, I, I think that, um, you know, I would say pace is growing fast. And on the idea of natural gas affecting it, um, well, I think it does, right? I mean, lower gas prices are um, certainly make the economics of doing an alternative, such as wind and solar, uh, less compelling. I would note that most of the folks doing the installation have a multi-decade time scale though, so they probably aren't exactly responding to the minutia of the market here at the moment, uh, but that's always up for debate. So Patricio, uh, I think some of your utilities have been pulling back on some of their CapEx plans, but uh, mm -hmm. you tell me, what's, uh, what's your view? 
Yeah, sure. So the yeah the the lowering of gas prices, the lower gas prices, which are also depressing wholesale power markets uh, here in Europe, uh, will have an effect uh, for 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 renew for new renewable projects that sell uh, merchant power that sell into the grid. Uh, for sure, and and we've been seeing that or, or that pullback in in capex for for um, for renewable power buildouts mainly concentrate around, uh, for example, Spain. Spain is a place where power prices are very competitive, very low uh, because there's a lot of sun um, and wind there. So uh, we have uh, been seeing a pullback from major utilities like like Iberdrola, where which um, is you know, uh, betting on 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 investing in transmission grids and distribution grids, where where it holds a competitive advantage, uh, versus power generation in in Spain, where, where there's a lot of small uh, smaller size developers that are cannibalizing the market, um, and we've seen um, also uh, the the pre prevalence of of a duck curve there, meaning that the prices become negative at certain points of the day um, in the grid because there's oversupply, um, and now curtailments are also up, meaning that regulators need to pay. Uh, pay for the power not being utilized because we don't have storage for a lot of that power. Um, so, so on that front, it will definitely affect them. Uh, but, but I think it's important to caveat that the most uh, renewable developers don't sell um, all of their power um, to to merchant uh, to merchant off takers. Um, they actually sell it via usually via PPA, so power purchase price agreements um, that are very long term, that are t 10 or 15 year. Um, um, price agreements that tend to be inflation indexed, or, or and they also sell them through long-term contracts with uh, with regulators or, or the, the so-called uh, contracts for difference. So it's it's very much a split between those three. So they sell supply directly to end consumers. That that part is exposed to lower wholesale power prices. But I think the other two sectors, so PPAs and CFDs, th those are less uh, less impacted. Uh, can, can I just follow up a little bit on some of that, in particular what you were saying about China, Rob, because let's start with three letters, BYD. Um, build your dreams, the automaker, now one of the largest uh, automakers in the world, all electrics. Um, you can buy one for 10 grand. Um, and why? what's happening is just the same thing we've seen happen in the past. In Europe is scrambling to put tariffs because it's crushing their businesses it's it's you're seeing what's happening is similar to what henry ford did to the automobile world in in 20 1920 the 20s i should say but also one thing that's significant about mentioned solar is one thing i've heard from bn boomler new energy finance and from nat bollard former colleague there and from on the terminal bi space china and ni space china is what's happening is with through the significant completely autocratic leader of leadership Mr. Z, they pushed forced banks to, to push away from lending for property sector and, and lending more to what you're seeing happening in solar and, and electric vehicles. So there's severe deflationary forces in all those forces. The property crisis just reverting just like Japan did. We saw that happen and it's just as expensive in China was a few years ago, 2015 or so. And then the, the massive um, focus on the pure supply chain of by day and be on the pressure prices down it's nothing but bearish forces for overall ppi when ppi in china right now is minus three percent it's deflationary what reverses that I, I don't know yet i think it's okay obviously it's gonna be stimulus they'll be bouncing but to me those macroeconomic trends are just so significant that they're unstoppable right now and maybe you've seen it reflected not lately in the u.s but certainly u.s ppi is negative germany ppi is negative japan ppi is negative they're very synonymous with commodities and there's that issue with tangible and intangible assets so what i want to um rope in now is it's just paramount amount also we have to focus on two key things this year is the the shift from a year ago last year remember china was going to come out there was expectation china was going to come out of the, the lockdowns and the demand pull we're seeing the opposite and the u.s election what does the u.s election mean is drill it will if we get um this you know it's all about three people in the world right now z Putin, Mr. Putin, President Z and President Putin, and potential another President Trump. It means very deflationary forces for commodities. Drill at will. Now, it might be good for the dollar, I think, if there's tariffs, which is probably bad for gold, too. But every day you hear and see this is in the polls where Mr. Trump's leaning, you see that pressure and people see it coming. So again, I, I look at and I ask our audience and ask us is let's look at what's the upside. How do you stop these, this significant wave that's all heading to lower 
deflationary forces and for commodities. And sure, we're going to get blips. And I think all the traders in the world get it, that they are just looking for opportunities to sell. But what you mentioned about what China solar and all the in, installed um, installations last year, it's just um, – it's example what's happening when you can do this with the technology. I have an electric car, I had solar in my house, electric bikes, and I just tested the cost effectively. Now it's just, it's happening, it's becoming the mainstream. What stops it? That means I, we should have demand for industrial metals, but even they're heading lower. So I'm looking for me, for me, the indications for what's going to come out of this industrial metals should be creeping up higher, and they're not. I mean, copper's down almost, what, 4% on the year, only because, partly because it bounced a little bit last year. So I'm looking for leading indicators of this being over, and the number one leading indicator right now is natural gas is too cheap. Um, and all commodities are probably going to get cheap before they can start bouncing. And natural gas hasn't had its bounce yet. All right. I think that's a great place to leave it. I want to thank uh, everyone who joined us here today. I want to thank uh, Mike McGlone and Patricio Alvarez for uh, sharing their thoughts. Uh, we'll get together next Wednesday at the same time. We'd love to have you join us next week as well. And I will flag that later uh, at, here in April, April 2nd, 3rd, we're going to be gathering in Kansas City for another in-person meeting. So fancy a trip to Kansas City or if you're based somewhere in that region, make sure to uh, reach out to any of us. We're happy to connect you to that event. And of course, we will uh, be holding events in uh, New York, London, and elsewhere uh, throughout the year. So. Uh, always uh, reach out if you have any questions about not just what we're discussing, but maybe something that's on your mind. Uh, you've got a sense for what we uh, think about and cover, and we're always keen to hear from you. So we look forward to being in touch. Take care. Have a great rest of your week.